when there's been oversupply on new cars. I think we said it right at the very start. We've just given new cars away. All of a sudden now we're selling new cars at this price. Mm. You know, it's it's bizarre at the moment. I walked through one of our larger showrooms yesterday and we had eight, nine, ten car showrooms with two cars on display. <laughs> but yet our order take is fantastic. So actually mm. that says you can operate this business without these you know, big, big gym palaces. I think the other issue we've got to think about, though, is how we deal with staff on this because it's a different calibre of staff that you'll need for agency because if the consumer's done the majority of it now online and actually it's the final little piece that they want to come in and check the colour, then actually you don't need, you know, you don't really need salespeople for that. You need more customer advisors. So I think the bigger shift for the network is in terms of that side of it personally and it's adapting to the staff changes but uh, but I think there could be some good wins with agency but the businesses will have to be very different to what they look today Welcome to this latest instalment of the AM News Show podcast our first of 2022 we're joined today by a great panel of guests we've got uh, Darren Ardron Managing Director of Perry's Motor Group. We have Steve Young, Managing Director of the ICDP, and Jim Saker joining us from Loughborough University. Uh, hope you enjoy a great show, and please do subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from the AM News Show podcast. Welcome to the AM Podcast, guys. Thanks for joining me today. Um, unfortunately, we're without uh, Tim Rose, uh, the AM editor, due to COVID in the family. Uh, so we decided not to take the risk of bringing him into this airtight recording studio with us all. So uh, he'll be back next time. Um, but really, I've invited you all here today because we wanted to get the year off to a good start, really, and and hopefully reflect on on last year, which turned out to be a lot better than many people anticipated, uh, certainly in terms of profitability. Um, but really, I, I guess, as well, look forward to a year where there's still an awful lot of uncertainty and, and obviously... We're all hoping that people can make the best of it and, and have another great year. Um, we recently ran the AM Outlook 22 survey, which I hope you guys took a quick look at. But, um, I mean, those results really spelled out the fact that many retailers don't quite know what the year is going to bring. There's a real spread of, of answers. I think over 50% of people suggested that profitability could stay the same or reduce a little. Um, but really the spread of answers suggested that no one quite knows where the market's going right now. So um, I guess I'll start with you, Darren, on the on the shop floor. Okay. I mean, what, 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 are your, what are your hopes at, at, at Perry's for this year? How are you sort of marking a, a path through what we don't know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's like you say, Tom, I think <clears throat> we don't know what we don't know at the minute. Do we? That's, that, that's the trouble. But um, look, we've had a really good year in... 2021 um, far better than than we would have ever predicted I think personally I think 2022 will be good um, will it be as good as 2021 probably not um, because you know there was a lot of support money still in 2021 particularly if you take the first quarter you know this time last year we were still operating in a form of lockdown um, we've got things like the rate support until the end of April I think it is this year and then we hit normality. And I think one of the biggest problems we will face as a dealer group, like most dealer groups this year, is we just have to be careful of cost creep at the minute because all of a sudden it's all starting to come back in. Um, you know, there are pressures around staff. There are pressures around wages. We've got very high inflation at the minute. Um, utility costs at the minute, you know. We're just starting to look at utility costs and everything is going up. So I, I think at the top line, I think we'll be absolutely fine. I just think we need to be very careful from an expense point of view. But overall, I'm relatively opt optimistic about 22. Is, is there a sense, you know, I, I guess after all that we've been through in 2020, 2021, there must be a feeling now that you really want to ramp things up where you can and, and, and accelerate uh, you know, a period of, of growth or stability at the very least. So, uh, are those cost pressures really, you know, is, is that a headache in doing that? It must be, must be it, drawing. Yeah, it's always a headache in doing it. And, and I think, you know, if we look back over the last two years, we've all learned so much about the industry. You know, we've all learned where we need to take it to, what we need to do, what we can do when we put under such massive pressures. 
Um, but yeah, there is a cost attached to some of this. You know, we've learned the value of staff, um, but but there is a cost attached to everything. But but yeah, we have. We've learned we've learned a lot. And um, as I say personally, I just want to crack on with twenty twenty two, and you know, let's go for another great year. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's got uh, what what other attitude can there be, can there be, Jim? I'll I'll, I'll come to you. Mm. I mean, uh, there must be people. At, who've taken your Loughborough University course coming back saying, you know, you, you couldn't teach us this, Jim. You've sold us short. You never taught us how to deal with a pandemic. <laughs> what, there, are many, there are many people who've got the pandemic wrong. <laughs> <And let's> not, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> let's, let's not pick on the academics. <laughs> there are a number of politicians who haven't done too well on it either. Um, no, I think the issue of uncertainty is the biggest uh, factor. And as Darren said, you know, going forward in 2022, how you handle the increase in cost, the how quickly the supply side on the new car will kick in. Um, I think the profitability on used will remain solid, whether it will be <laughs> the same levels as we've had in 2021. That's, a, I think, a completely different uh, matter because I think the mix of stock will be a, a big issue. You know, what, what products you've got on the used car side will be a, a big factor. And then I think the other f- issue of uncertainty is – will be the background discussion and the noise which is going on about agency model and how that works through. You know, obviously very little will happen, I don't think, in 2022, but there will be a lot of talking going on. And I think that's part of that issue of the uncertainty that people like the NFDA and all the rest of the lobbying bodies will be saying, well, is this good for the dealer world or not? And how that pans, its, pans out going forward will be, I think, to me, one of the issues which is not forefront but underlying 2022 going forward mm. for, for those you know in a career in automotive who want to progress or for those considering a career in, in automotive now particularly retail you know it has, has has the course the academic the training side of the industry adapted at all in in light of what's happened or are we keeping to the core principles is that all you can do i think that the it's more to do with attitude as much as anything else the core principles are still there, but in the same way as many young people now will say, I'm going to have a multi-career uh, option in my as I go through life, that they're going to do different things. The same type of approach, I think, needs to be taken within the sector, that we're going to have people who will switch from one particular uh, part of the business to another. And in getting the people on, on board who have that skill set to be able to trans- have transferable skills from one part of the business to another as the business shapes and develops. As Darren said, people are so critical to this. Having the right people with that flexibility, I think, will be a, a big issue going forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we covered um, what some described as a, as a skills crisis or still, still describe as a skills crisis, not, not going away. Um, I you think know. that's true, especially with the change in technology uh, the powertrain, etc. The level of investment that the dealers will be making, with virtually every manufacturer throwing everything at EV or BEV uh, primarily, that becomes an issue. So there, it's the multi-skilling, the transferable skills, the whole range of that area. I think is something which will be need to be addressed in 2022. Yeah, new new challenges, yeah. new challenges along the way. Hi, Steve. Welcome to you down in the corner there. That's okay. I'm quite comfy. Uh, it looks quite. <laughs> <laughs> it looks that way. Uh, good to see you. Um, I just wanted to come in, into you, certainly from a, a manufacturer perspective throughout throughout 22. I mean, the, the supply issues, are, uh, they, they don't appear to be going away anytime soon. You know, what what is the ICDP think about, you know, the, the outlook for the year? You, you must be mapping this and, and scratching your heads, are you? Uh, well, we always do lots of head scratching, but <laughs> I think that the... 22 will see some manufacturers get back into free supply or relatively free supply. And, uh, you know, if you look at the comments from the headquarter level, then it looks like the Koreans will probably be amongst them. Clearly, they've got growth ambitions still. Uh, They've got great products, lots of them. Uh, Toyota seemed to be in a better position, but then I noticed that they've got had some downtime again uh, this week, uh, I believe. So the, you'll get an unequal return to free supply. And to start off with, it would be very difficult to believe that those manufacturers will not take advantage of that opportunity. And they'll still be able to sell the cars. The dealers will still be able to sell the cars at full retail with no discounts 
because they're the only available options. Uh, the question will be when the others start to get free supply, how do they respond? And in turn, how do the ones who got there first respond? And so I think that that transition from restricted supply to uh, free supply is going to be quite chaotic. And I think that could tip in perhaps in the third quarter, certainly in the fourth quarter. And uh, in turn, perhaps start to free up the used car market a little bit. And some people will get that wrong and some people will get it right. And I'm not sure that all the algorithms and experience in the world is going to help. You're just going to have to be very, very fleet of foot to, to manage your exposure on used cars and make sure you're not stuck with overpriced stock, buying stock in at the wrong price or selling it out uh, at a lower price than you need to. So I think those are the main factors, but I, I do think it will be the back end of the year before that starts to play through. Certainly the, the conversations I've had so far seem to suggest there's not going to be, you know, the, the quote seems to be there's not going to be a seismic change in, in used car pricing. Do, do you think that's something that's going to be hard to manage? I spoke to Bill Berman at Pendragon recently. They're obviously increasing their investment in used, um, and he seemed to suggest that it would be easily predictable as uh, new car supply came back online. Do you, do you think that's the case? I'm not sure I'd use the word easily. Um, <laughs> clearly, the, the, the dealers do get some advance notice of when supply is starting to improve. They'll see the lead time start to come down. They'll see the, you know, the orders that they put in for a delivery in four months' time, five months' time, start to come in a month or two earlier. So you're going to get advance notice that supply is improving. Um, I don't know that that makes it easy. Yeah. To, to, yeah. to to manage the transition. It just says that you've got to take into account all of those indicators and uh, start to manage your, your, your policy, stocking policy, buying policy, pricing um, accordingly. People showing a lot of faith in the data, at least, you know, that there is that to lean back on. Well, there's no experience that's going to help, really, in mm -hmm. the current circumstance. It has to come from the data. How much of a concern is that for you, Darren, that used car headache, conundrum, you know, I guess at the moment it's still a case of how do we acquire enough stock? But at some point, you know, are you going to have to consider that prices will, will start to dip? Yeah, I mean, obviously we hope that they won't, but I think we need to face reality. And um, I think at some point they'll they'll harden. Uh, hopefully they won't drop out of the sky. I have no indications to see that that will happen. And I think, as Steve said, it really is a case about managing your stock carefully. You know, you, you've got to anything that gets to 60 days now, you've got to, you know, I've always said to our guys, used cars is a little bit like stocks and shares. There's a time to get in and there's a time to get out of it. And, <clears throat> you know, you've just got to take that risk at 60 days and you've just got to move it along. And, you know, I'm focusing very heavily this year in group on stock term mm. and just keep the thing going. Uh, because, again, as Steve said, you do get advance notice of uh, supply coming through but at the minute it is all over the place um so it's it is a headache but i think if you're if you're on top of it you can control it and stock to, stock turn is 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 a mechanism that will help you be a little bit more fleet of foot when that, that yeah, trend yeah you just, you just keep your eye on the data you just keep your eye on the metrics and um you know i think you've got to be brave this year in particular not to just hold on to stock thinking there's another buy around the corner and i'll make more money on it um, you've got to turn it over and, and flip it again because, you know, for every car you sell, it's two hours in your workshop as well, isn't it? And that's what you've got to look at. You've got to look at the whole bigger picture on it. Well, we've heard that suggested as well. You know, I mean, the, the, there's a range of opinions across the board, isn't there? But in 2020, people were saying, you know, you can you can hang on to these cars. Don't they don't were. take the money early, you know, yeah. and, and see what happens. So that that you think will change this year? I, I think you've just got to be very in control of, of very in control of it. It, it. You know, last year was a a real freak year for the used car industry. You know, in my 30 plus years of the industry, I've never seen used car values go up by 25, 26%. 28%. Yeah, 28%, yeah, yeah. whatever it was. It's yeah. just unheard of. And, you know, I think it's almost inevitable they won't go up 28% again. So I think we've just got to be very cautious, but equally not panic either. You know, it's just a bit of a skill, really. Is, is this the year where the disruptors you know, emergence into the market, will their place in in the sector be galvanised or do you think this is the year where the established retailers are going to be able to sort of fight back and, and show that they can do all this stuff just as well? 
Um, I think it'll be the uh, the retailers fight back, to be honest with you, because, you know, the hardest part for everybody in this last 12 months has been sourcing used car stock. It's mm. been really difficult when the new car markets collapsed. Um, you know, if I look at our group, for example, we always carries, carry orders over at the end of every month. It's inevitable. But, you know, we've gone into 2022 with thousands and that is unheard of. So mm. we know we've got lots of part exchangers coming through. I would imagine for the disruptors, um, particularly if OEMs aren't supplying fleets and rentals, used car stock will be hard to procure. So I think the dealers can come back fighting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you, would you say that's the, that's the same, Jim? I mean, we've, yeah, seen, I, we've seen this week that Kazoo's share price has halved since it was listed, but that, that seems to be a trend in the tech sector. So, you know, where, where's it headed? Well, I think most people thought Kazoo was overvalued when it uh, went to market anyway. So I think the reduction there is just a, a normalising, really, about the potential that it's got. And I think I totally agree with Darren. This this issue about get access to stock is a big issue. And I think the only uh, one uh, area which you're looking at and going, well, what about Constellation? And, you know, the takeover of Marshall Motor Group. We buy any car.com, they own BCA, they own Cinch. And to me, that is probably one of, although it's not a recognised disruptor as such, it is going to be one of the major disruptions going forward because they, they then have access to vehicles across the uh, value chain, and that becomes a, a factor. And I think that's, you know, I've written in, in the in AM about it, that, you know, I think part of the Constellation takeover in Marshall will actually potentially be a bigger motivator, a bigger drive towards the agency model by a lot of manufacturers, thinking we, we don't actually want this in this way. Now, to me, how that works going forward is going to be a, the, you know, a test of the, the power within the value chain and the, the, the channel power that's going forward. Absolutely. I guess a lot of a lot of the larger groups o- over the coming months are going to be looking how OEMs react to that Constellation deal and what, you know, what, their, what their response is, whether, whether they have the ability to, to come out of it, whether they want to come out of it. With agency on the way, it ticks a lot of boxes, doesn't it, the Constellation group? So. It, it presents a challenge, mm. I must admit, because you know, I think it was quite a shock for a lot of people when they took over um, Marshall. And the potential access to new new vehicles, you know, I don't know what the arrangement will be, and we're not quite sure the legal situation. But you know, does that therefore mean that Cinch can sell new cars? You know, that that becomes a, a factor in, that comes into play. So you're looking at that and saying, well, it's still got to be worked out. There's still got to be a lot of legal stuff going on. Steve's probably got an insight into it that I don't, but it look at it from from a perspective of the channel and how it operates and how efficient it is, then that becomes a disruptor. So it's a constellation becomes a disruptor. Yeah, Have you run I, the numbers I, yet, Steve? Yeah, I, I don't think that we, um, we know uh, what the motivation was for the deal. I mean, the, the, I absolutely agree with Jim that uh, you can look at it as a uh, constellation trying to get some secure supply for... Uh, for Cinch and the and the uh, their sort of efforts in that direction, but in doing so, then you basically kill Marshalls. Uh, so, you know, it it could be a it could be a, a reason, but it's got its issues around that. Um, you know, TDR, which is the private equity group that sits above all of this, have done quite a lot of shuffling of different assets in the last year or so with with lease plan and next car and so on. And, you know, the other way you could look at it is that TDR is being uh, leading the way for private equity in terms of getting to the dealer business and that Marshalls is the platform from which they build out a European Mm -hmm. dealer group. So, you know, which would be a different strategy and it would say that you'd want to ring fence the Marshalls business and make sure that Cinch wasn't getting access to all the cars. We just don't know, and there's no obviously no obligation on Constellation to tell us. Um, but I think the, the general point about access to, to used car stock is not just an issue for 22 for the disruptors, it's an issue going forward, because the, the more that uh, manufacturers or dealers in their own right uh, control the remarketing of the used cars, then the more difficult it is for the disruptors to try to uh, secure a stock. And the whole uh, argument of Kazoo, albeit it's flawed and albeit the valuation was totally ridiculous and still is totally ridiculous in my view, 
um, was that they were going to grow a scale European business. And the only way you can do that in used cars if you've got secure supply. Yeah. And they, they haven't told us how they're going to do that yet. And, you know, they've done, you know, small deals to, you know, with specific fleets for, for, for defleeting, but that's not going to supply an animal as thirsty as, uh, as kazoo. Mm. I think it's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, vehicle lifetime value and over the, you know, mm. year, the past year and customer lifetime value. A lot of manufacturers will be looking and saying, right, if the value chain for Bev doesn't work, that basically we've got to keep it within the franchise at least 1.6 turns or, or cycles, possibly more, then you have a completely different mindset on how the business will be run. And therefore, the manufacturers will want to keep the uh, used vehicles within the franchise. Mm -hmm. They, With the data, they control, have more information about the vehicle, they have more information about the customer. And therefore, it, it squeezes the, the disruptors as regards their supply, if that's the strategy go, the manufacturer is going to adopt. Yeah. And if you look at Haycar as a, as a good example of that, you know, it's been set up in order to provide um, a apparently neutral channel by which the manufacturers can, can remarket the cars. And in Germany, uh, they have a, a specific offer uh, from, from Volkswagen, the major, major shareholder in Haycar, a specific, specific offer on ID. So all of the ex-company IDs, all of the ex-demonstrators and so on, all get offered through Haycar, including on subscription. Uh, they want to keep that in the family. And, and part of it is for the lifetime value and part of it is to protect the residuals. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas if they just put it out through auction, then the market will expose what the real demand is for an EV. And that's not just a, that's not a Volkswagen problem. That's a problem for the whole industry at the moment because people are uncertain, technology is changing, uh, government support is changing. So uh, managing residuals on EVs is a very good reason to try and keep them in the, family for a couple yeah. of life cycle, a couple of ownership cycles. So do you see the proportion of PCP to PCH changing over the next two years? Um, I, 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 I'm not sure. I think that the, the manufacturers would like it to go to PCH. They, they, they would like to do more leasing. And mm -hmm. in continental Europe, you don't tend to have a PCP equivalent to the same extent anyway. So the, the thing they're familiar with is personal leasing, and that's growing you know, really quite quickly in some markets. And it's something they can understand, something they can put in a corporate strategy at the at the head office level and then deploy to the markets. Mm -hmm. And the UK, I think, are a bit of an anomaly in that. It is something that the retail groups themselves are, are responding to as well, that, you know, the leasing and the, the subscription model to a certain degree, often with the help of outside providers, I think Hendy Group and Peter Vardy, you know, yeah. among those that have launched recent schemes is that something you guys are looking at at Perry's uh, we, we have a separate leasing company yeah um, <clears throat> but it's not a buyback arrangement it's literally just through third-party funders but I think everybody's got to start looking at alternative mm. profit streams now um, you know because when agency we've talked a bit about agency today I think you know we need to be honest about agency I don't think the dealer network will be better and any better off when agency comes it's just a shift of how, how you do things so I think we've all got to look at different avenues of revenue as we move forward see what you can hold on to or yeah. see where you can diversify yeah absolutely, mm. absolutely. I think the, the diversification point is important because you know you can run the numbers and you can show that dealers can be better off under agency and the manufacturers could be better off you know there is a win-win possibility but I think if you look at the indications from those who've implemented it or are in discussions about implementing it, then it seems fairly clear to me that the responsibility for taking cost out of the physical network is going to fall back on the dealers. Yeah. You know, which you can say is unfair and it's unjust and the dealers only invested because the manufacturers told them to. But the indications are that the manufacturers recognize they need to get fixed cost out, but they're going to do that by not giving the dealer enough commission to cover the networks as they stand today, yeah. you know, with the gin palaces, with the uh, too many outlets, every outlet being the same and so on. So that restructuring uh, responsibility will fall back on the dealers and the dealers who find alternative uses for 
sites, whether that's a used car site or it's for property development or it's for something else altogether, you know, subscription offer or, or, or something non-automotive will do better than the ones who end up in a fire sale. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's interesting to see what different models will come from different manufacturers. And I think we've spoken before, you and I, Steve, about, you know, the, the, the different relationships that a dealer group will have with their manufacturer partners as some transition to an agency model and others don't. It's, it's going to be a strange effect for a, for a sector where the metrics, the KPIs have been so set for so long, we're going to face a headache with yeah. compiling the AM100, for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, thankfully, but yeah. someone will. Um, so, you know, how, what, how, how much of a headache is that in balancing, well, balancing your books, Darren, you know, when agency comes in? Well, I, th- I think at this point, Tom, we there's still an awful lot we don't know about agency. You know, we're all reading mm. up on it. And we're all sort of think we know how it will work. Um, I think it will be a headache, but equally, I think it could be a massive opportunity as well, because, you know, for years and years and years when there's been oversupply, on new cars, I think we said it right at the very start. We've just given new cars away. All of a sudden now, we're selling new cars at this price. Mm. You know, it's it's bizarre at the moment. I walked through one of our larger showrooms yesterday, and we had eight, nine, ten car showrooms with two cars on display. <laughs> but yet our order take is fantastic. So actually, mm. that says you can operate this business without these, you know, big big gym palaces. I think the other issue we've got to think about though is how we deal with staff on this because it's a different caliber of staff that you'll need for agency because if the consumer's done the majority of it now online and actually it's the final little piece that they want to come in and check the color then actually you don't need you know you don't really need salespeople for that you need more customer advisors so i think the bigger shift for the network is in terms of that side of it personally and it's adapting to the staff changes but but i think there could be some good wins with agency but the businesses will have to be very different to what they look today and then of course you'll have the multi-complex issues of we will have some brands that are agency and some that aren't so then you've got a bit of a a double problem haven't yeah. you is is the shift gonna slip over more to to after sales i mean i know there's always a focus on after sales but equally we're seeing the car park is getting smaller the ev returns are getting smaller over time you know how you know how how is the market going to adapt to that particularly at a time where we, we're hearing that block exemption might be extended in its current form largely for a while and the brands like halfords are always and, and other people trying to break into the market is is that after sales piece going to become a bigger bigger concern for most retail i, groups? I think the problem needs to be more focused on after sales now than there ever has been <clears throat> you know, we, we, if you look at absorption figures, for years and years they've been dropping now, but fortunately we've covered it with the sales operations. Um, you know, if I take our group as a prime example, we started five years ago on a strategy of trying to tie as many people into after sales as we could, and fortunately we have, and it's been very well, and that's the bit that's kept our after sales operations very strong. But I think, yes, you've got to look at that, and I think you've got to look at all the other parts of your business at the minute that currently you sub out, you know, we still sub quite a lot of work out as an industry and actually look at what you can take internally. And, you know, we talked earlier about diversification. Mm-hmm. We do spend a lot of money out of the sector as a group. So where you can, try and take some of that back in and, and help these absorption figures. Because sadly, unless we do something, our indirect costs are only going to go up. So actually the balance will, will get worse unless we do something about it. And I expect there be, there's going to be some manufacturer schemes as well to keep the business within the franchise you know the i think toyota are running their relaxed scheme which is 10 years which includes the warranty with the service yeah. so therefore tying that in i think that will be something which is more will be rolled out by other manufacturers i, th- I think it's got to be jim yeah. absolutely yeah. it's got to be it's not just about you know having somebody for three years now and hope they come back i think it's got right. to tie them in now and just keep them keep them coming back yeah. that self-renewing warranty was uh, a simple but quite ingenious little trick of Toyota Lexus as well, wasn't it? You know, come in and we renew your warranty mm. every year. That was. It's also potentially a conquest mm. uh, because obviously if you, you've got people with older cars that are being serviced elsewhere, that can bring them back into the franchise if it's marketed effectively. Mm. I think uh, the, the problem is that the after-sales market is, de- is declining, it's in, in structural decline, yeah. uh, even with the best assumptions. You know, because of because of EVs, because of park development, mileage driven, and so on, and 
uh, you can you can quite easily see a further downside to that. You know, at the moment, you know, in our projections, uh, we've got a number of operations per car coming down by about fifteen percent. Uh, so the latest projection we just did last week. Uh, but that assumes that the EVs are still being serviced, you know, as they are today, you know, basically every year. Uh, when you've got other players coming along and potentially consumer organizations and so on saying, you know what, you don't need to get it serviced every year. And the mm. engineering reality is that you don't, uh, then that could decline, you know, further and faster. Uh, so yes, the dealers and independents for that matter, the Halfords of this world need to try and get as much of the market as they can. They need to spread out into the older vehicles for dealers, the younger vehicles for the independents. But that doesn't alter the fact there's not going to be enough work to go around. So there's going to be a shakeout for sure. And uh, the dealers and the repairers need to keep on top of that. You know, Halfords have got, you know, three times the number of repair outlets of the largest dealer group or the largest OEM franchise. Uh, and they've made clear that that's a, an area they want to expand. Well, what do we understand at the moment about the, the changes or the lack of change to, to block exemption? It seemed like the IAAF had had a, a bit of an insight uh, recently that things were going to carry on largely uninterrupted. The NFDA is still insistent that they would like to see quite a, a few changes. I, I think that to say it will be un, uh, carry on uninterrupted is... is an exaggeration because I'm a journalist, if, if, Steve. If, that's <laughs> well, I'm teeing you up here to give me the facts. That's to, all. <laughs> to be fair, you, you're reporting on on their view. Um, what what they've said is that the uh, the regulation itself will potentially continue for five years, um, but the regulation itself is only five pages long. Yeah, um, and it's just got a few hardcore restrictions in it. All of the interesting bit is in the guidelines, and they have said reportedly, that the guidelines will change. And that's all we were ever expecting to change. And uh, it's going to change uh, in terms of the motor vehicle block exemption. So the bit related to after sales, uh, we're anticipating it will change uh, to provide more protection to the independents, uh, to guarantee their access to connected car data, uh, to the diagnostic information, uh, and so on. So it won't be um, it, it, it won't be negative as such to to either side. It just tries to maintain the status quo of an open competition, which the Commission has always been uh, obsessed about. And now CMA over here is is following a similar path. It's on the on the general block exemption on sales. Then uh, we should get the final draft fairly soon, and we're anticipating some changes around. Uh, uh, online channels and and things to do with the sort of digitalization of sales uh, but those are not specific to automotive but they will have some impact but it's not going to it's not a reason to delay changes in terms of networks for example which has been quoted by one or two manufacturers we need to see what the block exemption is going to say block exemption is not going to say anything that uh, or we, we don't believe it will say anything that makes you radically change direction of travel you, you've anticipated my next question. I recently spoke to Honda. You might have, have seen. I saw. Um, and it, yeah, they 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 said they were looking at it, but they were going to wait for the outcome of the block exemption changes. I was going to say, what you know, what what changes could they be waiting for? You know, what bearing could it have? But it really, shouldn't have a, a bearing at this we, stage. We, we don't think so. I mean, I saw I saw your interview with Jean Marc, and uh, you know, Honda's a. You know, is is a, a cautious company. You know, and and it's not a surprise at all that they want to see what's there. Uh, but we're not anticipating it being uh, sufficient to to steer a decision on on formats. I guess from a from an IMI with your IMI hat on, Jim, and I guess from a consumer point of view, and the NFDA pointed it out quite rightly as well. You know, the the competition in in the market is something that has has driven good value, isn't it, really, at the end of the day? That, that should be allowed to continue, I guess. And I think, yeah, that, that comes through on virtually every authority that's involved with the the motor industry, that the, the fairness to customers has to be seen. You know, the FCA have 
been very strong on saying, look, is there a customer benefit from the way in which the we go about commissions, we go about a whole range of things. And so from that point of view, it's very much to do with the, the, the fairness of the relationship, which I think needs to be you know, preeminent. And I think that, that is something which comes through. I mean, I, these, these, all these changes in the market, the lack of supply, the block exemption changes, the, you know, the introduction of agency, they all, all seem to be headed in one sort of direction where the, the sales process is really streamlined. And, and I guess largely online, we've seen that from Volvo where they're looking to go 100% online, whether you're in the yep. showroom yep. or at home. What 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 does Perry's expect this year to bring in terms of online retail? Is it something that you're seeing rising, uh, you know, hand over fist? Or? No, I wouldn't say hand over fist. I, I think we're seeing it rise, um, but relatively steadily at the minute. I'd, I wouldn't perceive any major changes this year, quite, mm. quite frankly. Um, I think as the years progress, we're bound to see it because, you know, there's an awful lot of talk about it. But the, the one thing I would say, and is if we've all learned in the last two years about this industry, is we're damn resilient. So I think whatever gets thrown at the industry, we seem to be really good at dealing it. We, we said it right at the very start. You know, if we go back to March when we had to lock down, nobody knew how to deal with that. And yet we did. We got on with it. We dealt with it. Mm. And we've all come back stronger. So I think whatever changes happen at very high level, I think this industry is so resilient, they'll just get on and deal with it. Excellent. Jim, you think this year is going to be the year that digital takes off, or have we already seen that while people were locked away? I, I, I think that there's a, a number of forces at work, and I don't think digital is going to go you know, through the roof this year by any means. I think we've got to a point whereby people are now using it and as when they want to use it. I still think the omni-channel approach is something that's going to be with us through 2022. Um, it, I think, to me, it's the change in the structure on things like agency, that sort of thing, which will have a bigger knock, long-term effect going forward into how we structure the business and how, how it operates. I think from the manufacturer's point of view, they've um, I've just written a piece for AM saying you know some of the management thinking in the past has to be rethought on, uh, re- rethought. Things like just-in-time, you know, that, that kind of has gone out the window, you know, it's, it's just out of time all the time at the moment. And so therefore getting back in sync, as uh, uh, Steve has said, you know, how the, the manufacturers get that act, their act together. And that to me going forward over 2022 will be the, the biggest issue. How quickly that new car stock comes through, how you could maintain new car price, which I think is that, and that will have the knock on effect on the used car. And so for, from, from that perspective, I don't think the uh, digital side is going to, you know, suddenly take off. Uh, it will be a big part of the business, but not in 2022, maybe 23, 24, looking further down the line. The story of this year then, Steve, probably going to be at the mercy of supply by the sounds of it. Yeah, I think, I think that the uh, supply situation and the knock-on effect on used cars is, is going to be what dominates uh, results. Uh, for everyone, for the manufacturers and for the dealers, uh, I think digitalization. You know, I'd go further than than Jim. I think that in 2030 we will still have, you know, a significant number of people who uh, want to use primarily physical dealerships. You know, at the moment it's you know it, it's sort of 15 percent or something like that. Maybe it'll be five, but you'll have this big core in the middle, as we do today th- from our consumer research of. Uh, 70, 80 percent who want to use both and they want to use them flexibly, not as you dictate. So uh, more digital capabilities is a long running story, but the physical dealer will remain in some form. And yeah, the questions about formats and contracts and so on is going to become uh, a bigger feature of the discussions during this year. But the next, the first one to implement, as we know, is not till next year in the UK. So there's the actual amount of on the ground experience at the moment is extremely limited, and it's all compromised by the fact there's no supply. It doesn't matter whether you're an agency or franchise; you're still selling at full retail. So, is it working or is it not working? You know, we don't know. Makes sense. So, but I think when it comes to digital, I think the bit which is still missing is the big data piece. Mm. Because with connected car and uh, the embedded technology in vehicles, there's going to be a build-up of big data. 
and how the manufacturers use that big data, how that's shared or communicated with dealers, the whole issue is still bubbling behind the scenes. There's a lot of work being done in that area. So core car retail skills might still be the order of the day <laughs> this year. I think you need both, Tom. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, we, we've definitely seen it where people definitely take the journey further online. They go that little bit further and they may well leave that deposit, but absolutely they still want to come and feel and touch it. And I think that's where you need that human interaction. Um, so, you know, we've definitely seen that. We've definitely seen it go a little bit further. Absolutely. Let's hope the year brings uh, similar profitability to the one that we've just seen. Let's hope so. Thanks ever so much for joining us, guys. Um, we will chat to each of you uh, individually for other segments of the podcast, but great, great to speak to you as a collective. Thanks for your time. Mm-hmm.